Preface of Eight Pillars of Prosperity. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Eight Pillars of Prosperity by James Allen. Preface it is popularly supposed that a greater prosperity for individuals or nations can only come through political and social reconstruction this cannot be true apart from the practice of the moral virtues in the individuals that comprise a nation better laws and social conditions will always follow a higher realization of morality among the individuals of a community but no legal enactment can give prosperity to nay it cannot prevent the ruin of a man or a nation that has become lax and decadent in the pursuit and practice of virtue the moral virtues are the foundation and support of prosperity as they are the soul of greatness they endure for ever and all the works of a man which endure are built upon them without them there is neither strength stability nor substantial reality but only ephemeral dreams to find moral principles is to have found prosperity greatness truth and is therefore to be strong valiant joyful and free james allen end of preface recording by andrea fiore chapter 1 of eight pillars of prosperity by james allen this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Chapter 1 Eight Pillars. Prosperity rests upon a moral foundation. It is popularly supposed to rest upon an immoral foundation, that is, upon trickery, sharp practice, deception, and greed. One commonly hears even an otherwise intelligent man declare that no man can be successful in business unless he is dishonest. Thus regarding business prosperity, a good thing, as the effect of dishonesty, a bad thing. Such a statement is superficial and thoughtless, and reveals a total lack of knowledge of moral causation, as well as a very limited grasp of the facts of life it is as though one should sow henbane and reap spinach or erect a brick house on a quagmire things impossible in the natural order of causation and therefore not to be attempted the spiritual or moral order of causation is not different in principle but only in nature the same law obtains in things unseen in thoughts and deeds as in things seen in natural phenomena man sees the processes in natural objects and acts in accordance with them but not seeing the spiritual processes he imagines that they do not obtain and so he does not act in harmony with them yet these spiritual processes are just as simple and just as sure as the natural processes they are indeed the same natural modes manifesting in the world of mind all the parables and a large number of the sayings of the great teachers are designed to illustrate this fact the natural world is the mental world made visible the seen is the mirror of the unseen the upper half of a circle is in no way different from the lower half but its sphericity is reversed the material and the mental are not two detached arcs in the universe they are the two halves of a complete circle the natural and the spiritual are not at eternal enmity but in the true order of the universe are eternally at one it is in the unnatural in the abuse of function and faculty where division arises and where man is wrestled back with repeated sufferings from the perfect circle from which he has tried to depart every process in matter is also a process in mind every natural law has its spiritual counterpart take any natural object 
and you will find its fundamental processes in the mental sphere if you rightly search consider for instance the germination of a seed and its growth into a plant with the final development of a flower and then back to seed again this also is a mental process thoughts are seeds which falling in the soil of the mind germinate and develop until they reach the completed stage blossoming into deeds good or bad brilliant or stupid according to their nature and ending as seeds of thought to be again sown in other minds a teacher is a sower of seed a spiritual agriculturist while he who teaches himself is the wise farmer of his own mental plot the growth of a thought is as the growth of a plant the seed must be sown seasonably and time is required for its full development into the plant of knowledge and the flower of wisdom while writing this i pause and turn to look through my study window and there a hundred yards away is a tall tree in the top of which some enterprising rook from a rookery close by has for the first time built its nest a strong northeast wind is blowing so that the top of the tree is swayed violently to and fro by the onset of the blast yet there is no danger to that frail thing of sticks and hair and the mother bird sitting upon her eggs has no fear of the storm why is this it is because the bird has instinctively built her nest in harmony with principles which ensure the maximum strength and security first a fork is chosen as the foundation for the nest and not a space between two separate branches so that however great may be the swaying of the top tree the position of the nest is not altered nor its structure disturbed then the nest is built on a circular plan so as to offer the greatest resistance to any external pressure as well as to obtain more perfect compactness within in accordance with its purpose and so however the tempest may rage the birds rest in comfort and security this is a very simple and familiar object and yet in the strict obedience of its structure to mathematical law it becomes to the wise a parable of enlightenment teaching them that only by ordering one's deeds in accordance with fixed principles is perfect surety perfect security and perfect peace obtained amid the uncertainty of events and the turbulent tempests of life a house or a temple built by a man is a much more complicated structure than a bird's nest yet it is erected in accordance with those mathematical principles which are everywhere evidenced in nature and here is seen how man in material things obeys universal principles he never attempts to put up a building in defiance of geometrical proportions for he knows that such a building would be unsafe and that the first storm would in all probability level it to the ground if indeed it did not fall about his ears during the process of erection man in his material building scrupulously obeys the fixed principles of circle square and angle and aided by rule plumb line and compasses he raises a structure which will resist the fiercest storms and affords him a secure shelter and safe protection all this is very simple the reader may say yes it is simple because it is true and perfect so true that it cannot admit the smallest compromise and so perfect that no man can improve upon it man through long experience has learned these principles of the material world and sees the wisdom of obeying them and i have thus referred to them in order to lead up to a consideration of those fixed principles in the mental or spiritual world which are just as simple and just as eternally true and perfect yet are at present so little understood by man as he daily violates them because he is ignorant of their nature and unconscious of the harm he is all the time inflicting upon himself in mind as matter in thoughts as things in deeds as natural processes there is a fixed foundation of law which if consciously or ignorantly ignored 
leads to disaster and defeat it is indeed the ignorant violation of this law which is the cause of the world's pain and sorrow in matter this law is presented as mathematical in mind it is perceived as moral but the mathematical and the moral are not separate and opposed they are but two aspects of a united whole the fixed principles of mathematics to which all matter is subject are the body of which the spirit is ethical while the eternal principles of morality are mathematical truisms operating in the universe of mind it is as impossible to live successfully apart from moral principles as to build successfully while ignoring mathematical principles characters like houses only stand firmly when built on a foundation of moral law and they are built up slowly and laboriously deed by deed for in the building of character the bricks are deeds business and all human enterprises are not exempt from the external order but can only stand securely by the observance of fixed laws prosperity to be stable and enduring must rest on a solid foundation of moral principle and be supported by the adamantine pillars of sterling character and moral worth in the attempt to run a business in defiance of moral principles disaster of one kind or another is inevitable the permanently prosperous men in any community are not its tricksters and deceivers but its reliable and upright men the quakers are acknowledged to be the most upright men in the british community and although their numbers are small they are the most prosperous the Jains in india are similar both in numbers and sterling worth and they are the most prosperous people in india men speak of building up a business and indeed a business is as much a building as is a brick house or a stone church albeit the process of building is a mental one prosperity like a house is a roof over a man's head affording him protection and comfort a roof presupposes a support and a support necessitates a foundation the roof of prosperity then is supported by the following eight pillars which are cemented in a foundation of moral consistency one energy two economy three integrity four system five sympathy six sincerity seven impartiality eight self-reliance a business built up on the faultless practice of all these principles would be so firm and enduring as to be invincible nothing could injure it nothing could undermine its prosperity nothing could interrupt its success or bring it to the ground but that success would be assured with incessant increase so long as the principles were adhered to on the other hand where these principles were all absent there could be no success of any kind there could not even be a business at all for there would be nothing to produce the adherence of one part with another but there would be that lack of life that absence of fiber and consistency which animates and gives body and form to anything whatsoever picture a man with all these principles absent from his mind his daily life and even if your knowledge of these principles is but slight and imperfect you could not think of such a man as doing any successful work you could picture him as leading the confused life of a shiftless tramp but to imagine him as the head of a business as the center of an organization or as a responsible and controlling agent in any department of life this you could not do because you realize its impossibility the fact that no one of moderate morality and intelligence can think of such a man as commanding any success should to all those who have not yet grasped the import of these principles and therefore declare that morality is not a factor but rather a hindrance in prosperity be a sound proof to them 
that their conclusion is totally wrong for if it was right then the greater the lack of these moral principles the greater would be the success these eight principles then in greater or lesser degree are the causative factors in all success of whatsoever kind underneath all prosperity they are the strong supports and howsoever appearances may be against such a conclusion a measure of them informs and sustains every effort which is crowned with that excellence which men name success it is true that comparatively few successful men practice in their entirety and perfection all these eight principles but there are those who do and they are the leaders teachers and guides of men the supports of human society and the strong pioneers of human evolution but while few achieve that moral perfection which ensures the acme of success all lesser successes come from the partial observance of these principles which are so powerful in the production of good results that even perfection in any two or three of them alone is sufficient to ensure an ordinary degree of prosperity and maintain a measure of local influence at least for a time while the same perfection in two or three with partial excellence in all or nearly all the others will render permanent that limited success and influence which will necessarily grow and extend in exact ratio with a more intimate knowledge and practice of those principles which at present are only partially incorporated in the character the boundary lines of a man's morality mark the limits of his success so true is this that to know a man's moral status would be to know to mathematically gauge his ultimate success or failure the temple of prosperity only stands in so far as it is supported by its moral pillars and as they are weakened it becomes insecure in so far as they are withdrawn it crumbles away and totters to ruin ultimate failure and defeat are inevitable where moral principles are ignored or defied inevitable in the nature of things as cause and effect as a stone thrown upward returns to the earth so every deed good or bad returns upon him that set it forth every unmoral or immoral act frustrates the end at which it aims and every such succeeding act puts it further and further away as an achieved realization on the other hand every moral act is another solid brick in the temple of prosperity another round of strength and sculptured beauty in the pillars which support it individuals families nations grow and prosper in harmony with their growth in moral strength and knowledge they fall and fail in accordance with their moral decadence mentally as physically only that which has form and solidity can stand and endure the unmoral is nothingness and from it nothing can be formed it is the negation of substance the immoral is destruction it is the negation of form it is a process of spiritual denudation while it undermines and disintegrates it leaves the scattered material ready for the wise builder to put it into form again and the wise builder is morality the moral substance form and building power in one morality always builds up and preserves for that is its nature being the opposite of immorality which always breaks down and destroys morality is the master builder everywhere whether in individuals or nations morality is invincible and he who stands upon it to the end stands upon an impregnable rock so that his defeat is impossible his triumph is certain he will be tried and that to the uttermost for without fighting there can be no victory and so only can his moral powers be perfected and it is in the nature of fixed principles as of everything finely and perfectly wrought to have their strength tested and proved the steel bars which are to perform the strongest and best uses in the world 
must be subjected to a severe strain by the iron master as a test of their texture and efficiency before they are sent from his foundry the brick maker throws aside the bricks which have given way under the severe heat so he who is to be greatly and permanently successful will pass through the strain of adverse circumstances and the fire of temptation with his moral nature not merely undermined but strengthened and beautified he will be like a bar of well-wrought steel fit for the highest use and the universe will see as the iron master his finely wrought steel that the use does not escape him immorality is assailable at every point and he who tries to stand upon it sinks into the morass of dissolution even while his efforts seem to stand they are crumbling away the climax of failure is inevitable while the immoral man is chuckling over his ill-gotten gains there is already a hole in his pocket through which his gold is falling while he who begins with morality yet deserts it for gain in the hour of trial is like the brick which breaks on the first application of heat he is not fit for use and the universe casts him aside yet not finally for he is a being and not a brick and he can live and learn can repent and be restored moral force is the life of all successes and the sustaining element in all prosperity but there are various kinds of successes and it is frequently necessary that a man should fail in one direction that he may reach up to a greater and more far-reaching success if for instance a literary artistic or spiritual genius should begin by trying to make money it may be and often is to his advantage and the betterment of his genius that he should fail therein so that he may achieve that more sublime success wherein lies his real power many a millionaire would doubtless be willing to barter his millions for the literary success of a shakespeare or the spiritual success of a buddha and would thereby consider that he had made a good bargain exceptional spiritual success is rarely accompanied with riches yet financial success cannot in any way compare with it in greatness and grandeur but i am not in this book dealing with the success of the saint or spiritual genius but with that success which concerns the welfare well-being and happiness of the broadly average man and woman in a word with the prosperity which while being more or less connected with money being present and temporal yet is not confined thereto but extends to and embraces all human activities and which particularly relates to that harmony of the individual with his circumstances which produces that satisfaction called happiness and that comfort known as prosperity to the achievement of this end so desirable to the mass of mankind let us now see how the eight principles operate how the roof of prosperity is raised and made secure upon the pillars by which it is supported end of chapter one recording by andrea fiore